Chapter Fifteen, Part One of the Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter Fifteen: The Seven Days, Part One. Harry did not awaken until late the next morning. Jackson, for once, allowed his soldiers a long rest, and they were entitled to it. When he rose from his blankets he found fires burning, and the pleasant odor of coffee, bacon, and other food came to his nostrils. Many wounded were stretched on blankets, but, as usual, they were stoics and made no complaint. The army, in truth, was joyous. Even more, it was exultant. Everyone had the feeling that he had shared in mighty triumphs, unparalleled exploits, but they gave the chief credit to their leader, and they spoke admiringly and affectionately of old Jack. The whole day was passed in luxury long unknown to them. They had an abundance of food, mostly captured, and their rations were not limited. The Acadian band reappeared and played with as much spirit as ever, and once more the dark, strong men of Louisiana clasped in one another's arms, danced on the grass. Harry sat with St. Clair, Happy Tom, and Dalton, and watched them. "'I was taught that dancing was wicked,' said Dalton. "'But it doesn't look wicked to me, and I notice that the general doesn't forbid it.' "'Wicked?' said St. Clair. "'Why, after we take Washington, you ought to come down to Charleston and see us dance then. It's good instead of wicked.' It's more than that. It's a thing of beauty, a grace, a joy, almost a right. All that Arthur says is true, said Happy Tom. I'm a sea islander myself, but we go over to Charleston in the winter. Still, I think you'll have to do without me at those dances, Arthur. I shall probably be kept for some time in the North, acting as proconsul for Pennsylvania or Massachusetts. "'Which way do you think we are going from here, Harry?' asked St. Clair. "'I don't think it's possible for General Jackson to stay longer than twenty-four hours in one place, and I know that he always goes to you for instructions before he makes any movement.' "'That's so. He spoke to me this morning, asking what he ought to do, but I told him the troops needed a rest of one day, but that he mustn't make it more than one day, or he'd spoil them. Happy Tom, who was lying on the ground, sat up abruptly. "'If you ever hear of old Stonewall spoiling anybody or anything,' he said, "'just you report it to me, and I'll tell you that it's not so.' "'I believe,' said Dalton, "'that we're going to leave the valley. Both Shields and Fremont are still retreating. A cavalry scouts brought in that word this morning.' We've heard also that Johnston and McClellan fought a big battle at a place called Seven Pines, and that after it McClellan hung back, waiting for McDowell, whom old Jack has kept busy. General Johnston was wounded at Seven Pines, and General Robert Edward Lee is now in command of our main army. "'That's news! It's more! It's history!' exclaimed St. Clair. "'I think you're right, Harry.' two to one that we go to Richmond. And for one, I'll be glad. Then we'll be right in the middle of the biggest doings. I'm feeling that way, too, said Happy Tom. But I know one thing. What's that? Not a soul in this army, except old Jack himself, will know a thing about it until it's done. And maybe we won't know very much then. I passed old Jack about an hour ago, and he saw me as clearly and plainly as I see you, but he did not tell me a thing about his plans. He did not even say a word, did not speak, just cut me dead. Not one of the four was destined for some days to learn what Jackson intended. His highest officers even were kept in the same ignorance. While the bulk of the army did little, the cavalry under Munford, who had succeeded Ashby, were exceedingly active. The horsemen were like a swarm of hornets in front of Jackson, and so great was their activity that the northern leaders were unable to gauge their numbers. Fremont, exposed to these raids, 
retreated farther down the valley, leaving two hundred of his wounded and many stores in the hands of Munford. Then Jackson crossed South River and marched into extensive woods by the Shenandoah, where his army lay for five full days. It was almost incredible to Harry and his friends that they should have so long a rest, but they had it. They luxuriated there among the trees in the beautiful June weather, listening to the music of the Acadians, eating and drinking, and sleeping as men have seldom slept before. But while the infantry was resting, the activity of the cavalry never ceased. These men, riding over the country in which most of them were born, missed no movement of the enemy, and maintained the illusion that their numbers were four or five times the fact. Harry, trying to fathom Jackson's purpose, gave it up after that comparatively long stay beside the Shenandoah. He did not know that it was part of a complicated plan, that Lee and Jackson, although yet apart, were now beginning their celebrated work together. Near Richmond, northern prisoners saw long lines of trains moving north, and apparently crowded with soldiers, for Jackson, of course, and intended to help him in his great march on Washington. But Jackson hung a complete veil about his own movements. His highest officers told one another in confidence things that they believed to be true, but which were not. It was the general opinion among them that Jackson would soon leave in pursuit of Fremont. The pleasant camp by the Shenandoah was broken up suddenly, and the men began to march. They knew not where. Officers rode among them with stern orders, carried out sternly. In front, and on either flank, rode lines of cavalry who allowed not a soul to pass either in or out. An equally strong line of cavalry in the rear drove in front of it every straggler or camp follower. There was not a single person inside the whole army of Jackson who could get outside it, except Jackson himself. An extraordinary ban of ignorance was also placed upon them, and it was enforced to the letter. No soldier should give the name of a village or a farm through which he passed, although the farm might be his father's, or the village might be the one in which he was born. If a man were asked a question, no matter what, he must answer, I don't know. The young southern soldiers, indignant at first, enjoyed it as their natural humor rose to the surface. "'Young fella,' said Happy Tom to St. Clair, "'what's your name?' "'I don't know.' "'Don't know your own name. Why, you must be feeble-minded. Are you?' "'I don't know.' "'Well, you may not know, but you look it. Do you think old Jack is a good general?' "'I don't know.' "'Do you think he's feeble-minded like yourself?' I don't know. What? You dare to intimate that Stonewall Jackson, the greatest general the world has ever known, is feeble-minded. You have insulted him, and in his name I challenge you to fight me, sir. Do you accept? I don't know. The two looked at each other and grinned. The ignorance of the army grew dense beyond all computation. Long afterward, I don't know, became a favorite and convenient reply, even when the knowledge was present. It was nearly two weeks after Port Republic before the troops had any idea where they were going. They came to a little place called Hanover Junction, and they thought they were going to turn there and meet McDowell, but they passed on, and one evening they encamped in a wood. As they were eating supper they heard the muttering thunder of guns toward the south, and throughout the brigades the conviction spread that they were on the way to Richmond. The next night Harry, who was asleep, was touched by a light hand. He awoke instantly, and when he saw General Jackson standing over him, he sprang up. "'I am going on a long ride,' said the General briefly, "'and I want only one man to go with me. I've chosen you. Get your horse. We start in five minutes.' Harry, a little dazed yet from sleep and the great honor that had been thrust upon him, ran nevertheless for his horse, and was ready with a minute to spare. "'Keep by my side,' said Jackson curtly, and the two rode in silence from the camp, watched in wonder by the sentinels, who saw their general and his lone attendant disappear in the forest to the south. 
It was one o'clock in the morning of a moonlight night, and the errand of Jackson was an absolute secret. Three or four miles from the camp a sentinel slipped from the woods and stopped them. He was one of their own pickets, on a far outlying post, but to the amazement of Harry, Jackson did not tell who he was. "'I'm an officer on Stonewall Jackson's staff, carrying dispatches,' he said. "'You must let me pass.' "'It's not enough. Show me an order from him.' "'I have no order,' replied the equable voice. "'But my dispatches are of the greatest importance. Kindly let me pass immediately.' The sentinel shook his head. "'Draw back your horses,' he said. "'Without an order from the general, you don't go a step further.' Harry had not spoken a word. He had ceased to wonder why Jackson refused to reveal his identity. If he did not do so, it must be for some excellent reason, and meanwhile the boy waited placidly. "'So you won't let us pass,' said Jackson. "'Is the commander of the picket nearby?' "'I can whistle, so he'll hear me.' "'Then will you kindly whistle?' The sentinel looked again at the quiet man on the horse, put his fingers to his lips, and blew loudly. An officer emerged from the woods and said, "'What is it, Felton?' and he glanced at the man on the horse and started violently. "'General Jackson!' he exclaimed. The sentinel turned pale, but said nothing. "'Yes, I'm General Jackson,' said the general, "'and I ride with this lieutenant of my staff on an errand. But both of you must swear to me that you have not seen me.' Then he turned to the sentinel. "'You did right to stop us,' he said. "'I wish that all our sentinels were as faithful as you.' Then, while the man glowed with gratitude, he and Harry rode on. Jackson was in deep thought and did not speak. Harry, a little awed by this strange ride, looked up at the trees and the dusky heavens. He heard the far hoot of an owl, and he shivered a little. What if a troop of northern cavalry should suddenly burst upon them? But no troop of the northern horse, no horse of any kind, appeared. Instead, Jackson's own horse began to pant and stumble. Soon he gave out entirely. It was not yet day, but dimly to the right they saw the roof of a house among some trees. It was a poor Virginia farm that did not have horses on it, and Jackson suggested to Harry that they wake up the people and secure two fresh mounts. The commander of an army and his young aide walked a little distance down a road, entered a lawn, drove off two barking dogs, and knocked loud on the front door of the house with the butts of their riding whips. A head was at last thrust out of an upper window, and a sleepy and indignant voice demanded what they wanted. "'We're two officers from General Jackson's army riding on important duty,' replied the general, in his usual mild tones. "'Our horses have broken down, and we want to obtain new ones.' "'What's your names? What's your rank?' demanded the gruff voice. "'We cannot give our names.' "'Then clear out, you're frauds. If I find you hanging about here, I'll shoot at you, and I tell you for your good that I'm no bad shot.' The shutter of the window closed with a bang, but the two dogs that had been driven off began to bark again at a safe distance. Harry glanced at his general. "'Isn't that a stable among the trees?' asked Jackson. "'Yes, sir.' "'Then we'll find our horses there. Get the other two and bring them here.' Harry obeyed promptly, and they opened the stable, finding good horses, of which they selected the two best to which they changed their saddles and bridles. "'We'll leave our own horses for our inhospitable friends,' said General Jackson and he'll not suffer by the exchange." Mounting the fresh horses, they rode rapidly, and, after the coming of the dawn, Harry saw that they were approaching Richmond, and he guessed now what was coming. General Jackson had in his pocket a pass sent to him by General Lee, and they swiftly went through the lines of pickets, and then on through Richmond. People were astir in the streets of the southern capital, and many of them saw the bearded man in an old uniform and a black slouch hat riding by, accompanied by only a boy, but not one of them knew that this was Stonewall Jackson, 
whose fame had been filling their ears for a month past. Nor, if they had known him, would they have divined how much ill his passage boded to the great army of McClellan. They went through Richmond and on toward the front. Midday passed, and at three o'clock they reached the house in which Lee had established his headquarters. "'Who is it?' asked a sentinel at the door. "'Tell General Lee that General Jackson is waiting.' The sentinel hurried inside, General Jackson and his aide dismounted, and a moment later General Lee came out, extending his hand, which Jackson clasped. The two stood a moment looking at each other. It was the first time that they had met in the war, but Harry saw by the glance that passed that each knew the other a man, not an ordinary man, nor even a man of ten thousand, but a genius of the kind that appears but seldom. It was all the more extraordinary that the two should appear at the same time, serving together in perfect harmony, and sustaining for so long by their united power and intellect a cause that seemed lost from the first. It was not any wonder that Harry gazed with all his eyes at the memorable meeting. He knew Jackson, and he was already learning much of Lee. He saw in the Confederate commander-in-chief a man past fifty, ruddy of countenance, hair and beard short, gray and thick, his figure tall and powerful, and his expression at once penetrating and kind. He was dressed in a fine gray uniform, precise and neat. Such was Robert Edward Lee, and Harry thought him the most impressive human being upon whom he had ever looked. "'General Jackson,' said General Lee, "'this is a fortunate meeting. You have saved the Confederacy.' General Jackson made a gesture of dissent, but General Lee took him by the arm and they went into the house. General Jackson turned a moment at the door and motioned to Harry to follow. The boy went in and found himself in a large room. Three men had risen from cane chairs to meet the visitor. One, broad of shoulders, middle-aged and sturdy, was Longstreet. The others, more slender of figure, were the two Hills. The major generals came forward eagerly to meet Jackson, and they also had friendly greetings for his young aide. Lee handed them glasses of milk which they drank thirstily. "'You'll find an aide of mine in the next room,' said General Lee to Harry. "'He's a little older than you are, but you should get along together.' Harry bowed and withdrew, and the aide, Charlie Gordon, gave him a hearty welcome. He was three or four years Harry's senior, something of a scholar, but frank and open. When they had exchanged names, Gordon said, "'Stretch out a bit on this old sofa. You look tired.' You've been riding a long distance. How many miles have you come? I don't know, replied Harry, as he lay luxuriously on the sofa. But we started at one o'clock this morning, and it is now three o'clock in the afternoon. Fourteen hours. It's like what we've been hearing of Stonewall Jackson. I took a peep at him from the window as you rode up. I suppose you didn't see much but dust. They certainly tell extraordinary things of General Jackson. It can't be possible that all are true. It is possible. They're all true, and more. I tell you, Gordon, when you hear anything wonderful about Stonewall Jackson, just you believe it. Don't ask any questions or reasons, but believe it. I think I shall, said Gordon, convinced. But don't forget, Kenton, that we've got a mighty man here, too. You can't be with General Lee long without feeling that you're in the presence of genius. And they're friends, not jealous of each other. You could see that at a glance. The coming of Jackson is like dawn bursting from the dark. I feel, Kenton, that McClellan's time is at hand. Harry slept a little after a while, but when he awoke the generals were still in council in the great room. I let you sleep because I saw you needed it," said Gordon with a smile. But I think they're about through in there now. I hear them moving about. General Jackson presently called Harry, and they rode away. The young aide was sent back to the Valley Army with a message for it to advance as fast as possible, in order that it might be hurled on McClellan's flank. 
others carried the same message, lest there be any default of chance. End of chapter 15, part 1